Hello, welcome everyone. Um, today's lecture, we are going to look at an example for finding 3D principal stresses and direction. So if you look at, uh, you know, if you go back a couple of lectures, we looked at examples of finding principal stresses and directions in two dimensions. Now we are going to essentially um, use an example to illustrate how we can find principal stresses and directions in three dimensions. The, the, to be, you know, the principles, so to speak, are the same for both these uh, cases, but obviously in 3D, uh, it is a little bit more, um, I would say, uh, extensive to find these uh, stresses and directions. Okay. So what are the objectives? So essentially we will compute uh, the principal stresses and principal directions for an uh, example problem, and that should be something that you can use for looking at other cases as well. Okay, so here's the example. So in this case, we are given the stress matrix, um, which is given here, okay? And the stress matrix is given in the x, y, z coordinate system. Okay, so again, we are looking at stress at a specific point, and the stress at the specific point is given by this stress matrix sigma, okay? And we are asked to find out the principal stresses and principal directions, okay, for this particular point, and also the maximum shear stress and you know the maximum shear stress planes are you can think of it as the normal to the maximum shear stress plane okay so when you have a problem like this when you're asked to find out principal stresses in 3d pretty much the first thing that you have to do is calculate the invariance i1 i2 and i3 okay just to remind you i1 is sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z okay and uh, i2 is sigma x sigma y and so on Okay, these uh, expressions were given to you in the last class. You don't have to actually like memorize them, but it'll be kind of good to know, you know, what kind of terms come into I1, I2, and I3, okay? Now, once you are given the stress matrix, it's essentially a question of substituting the values of sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, and tau x, y, tau y, z, and tau x, z into these expressions. And if you do that, you will find that in this particular case, uh, I1 is three MPa, I2 is minus six MPa square. That's something that I want you to pay attention to because it is a product of two stresses. So the unit should be MPa square, okay? Similarly, if you calculate what I3 is, it turns out to be minus eight MPa cube, okay? So again, I1, I2, and I3 have different units. They don't have the same units, okay? okay. So once you find I1, I2, and I3, then essentially you plug these values into the characteristic equations and then solve the characteristic equation, okay? So again, to remind you, the characteristic equation is this, okay? I want you again, note something here. I1 has a negative term in front of it. I2 has a positive term in front of it. And I3 has a negative term, okay? So you have to use the characteristic equation with the right signs for I1, I2, and I3. So these expressions for I1, I2, and I3 that I have put in here, okay, these are valid only for this characteristic equation. So if you have a characteristic equation where it's sigma PQ plus I1 sigma P square plus I2 sigma P plus I3 equal to zero, then the, the expressions for I1 and I2 that I have given you should have to be multiplied by a negative sign, okay? So again, these expressions that I've given you are correct for this equation, okay? Not an equation where the uh, terms have a different sign in front of them, okay? I, that's something that you must keep in mind. So with that, if you look at my sigma, my I1 is positive three MPa, so that is why it is this. Okay, minus three MPa, okay? My I2 is actually minus six MPa square. So that is why I have minus six sigma P here, okay? And my last term is minus eight MPa square, uh, MPa cube, and that's why my last term is positive eight here, because it's minus I3, and I3 is minus eight, so it's minus of minus is positive eight, okay? So you want to make sure that you don't make a mistake in the signs here, okay? Now, once you get this characteristic equation, then you can essentially solve this fairly easily. Uh, most of your calculators can do it in no time. And if you do the um, 
calculation, you will find that the three principal stresses are 4 MPA, 1 MPA, and minus 2 MPA. So here, I have already ordered them such that sigma P1 is greater than sigma P2 is greater than sigma P3, okay? So again, sometimes you use sigma P1, sometimes you use just sigma 1, okay? So you must be comfortable with both notations, okay? So what you have done so far is actually calculate what the principal stress is for this particular given stress matrix is, okay? Now, once you find the principal stresses, we can now go back and find out what the principal directions are, okay? And for that, you essentially use this equation. So sigma minus sigma p times i times o should be equal to zero, okay? Again, this is a vector equation. So this is actually a vector, and this is also a vector. Now, if you want to find out the principal direction corresponding to sigma p1, you substitute sigma p by sigma p1, okay? If you want to do it for sigma p2, you substitute sigma p2 there. So all that it means is that you take the stress matrix and then subtract essentially the principal stress number one from all the diagonal components, okay? That's all you're doing, okay? So the sigma x is three, so it becomes three minus four. Sigma y is zero, it becomes zero minus four. And sigma z is zero, so it becomes zero minus four, where four is sigma p1, okay? That is four, okay, and then times, LP1, MP1, NP1. So again, LP1, MP1, and NP1 are the direction cosines of the um, principal direction corresponding to the principal stress number one. Okay, so essentially you have this set of equations. Okay, and if you recall, these three equations that we have here are not independent equations. Okay, only two of them are independent. Okay, third equation is actually a dependent equation. So you can't explicitly solve for LP1, MP1, and NP1, just using these three equations. So you have to use the fact that the square root of LP1 square plus MP1 square plus NP1 square should be equal to one. Okay? And the reason that the square root of that quantity is equal to one is because LP1, NP1, and uh, NP1 are essentially the direction cosines of a unit vector, so which has a magnitude of one. Okay? So that's what essentially we are going to do. So first, what we do is we get these three equations, so minus LP1 plus NP1 plus NP1 should be equal to zero. And the way we get it is because this is going to be minus one, okay? So minus one times LP1 plus one times NP1 plus one times NP1, that should be equal to zero, okay? So that is how you get the first equation. And you can get the second and third equations the same way, okay? So you get those three equations and you can actually use any two of these equations to actually eliminate two of the variables. Okay, so in this case, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take equation one and equation two, these two, okay? And then if you add them together, what happens is that this term cancels off, okay? Minus LP1 plus LP1 should be equal to, that term cancels off. So essentially you get an equation where minus MP1, minus three MP1, plus three NP1 should be equal to zero, okay? So what that gives you is that MP1 should be equal to NP1. We don't know what MP1 is, but we know that it is equal to NP1, okay? So that is the first thing, okay? Then you can do a little bit more manipulation. For example, you can take the second equation here, multiply it by two, and then add it to the third equation, okay? And if you do that, you can eliminate NP1, okay? And if you do that, what you get is three LP1 minus six MP1, should be equal to zero, which means that LP1 is two times MP1, okay? So now if you look at these two equations here, we have both NP1 and LP1 in terms of MP1, okay? So we know that NP1 is MP1 and LP1 is two times MP1, okay? So essentially we have a relationship between L, M, and uh, N, okay? Now, we also know that LP1 square plus MP1 square plus NP1 square should be equal to one, because that is the sum of the squares of the components of a unit vector, okay? Now we can use the fact that LP1 is two times MP1, and the fact that NP1 is equal to MP1, okay? And if you use that fact, what you'll end up is that six MP1 square is equal to one, okay? Now, when you have an equation like this, 
you can of course take the square root and find out what MP1 is. And of course you can have, you can either take the positive square root or the negative square root. So MP1 could be plus or minus one over square root of six. But by convention, we usually take only the positive square root, okay? There's nothing wrong with taking the negative square root, it is just a convention, okay? And it will also become obvious why it doesn't matter whether it's the positive square root or the negative square root in a minute, okay? So now if you take the positive square root, we can find that MP1 is one over square root of six, LP1 is two times MP1, so it's two over square root of six, and NP1 is one over square root of six. And your OP1 is this, LP1, MP1, NP1, okay? Now, if you had taken MP1 to be minus one over square root of six, then your OP1 would have looked like this, okay? And that direction is essentially 180 degrees opposite to this direction, okay? So if you think about a cube, if this is the normal O1 cap, that is also a normal, okay? So this corresponds to maybe that, and this corresponds to that. Essentially, this is just opposite direction, so there's nothing really distinct between those two. Okay, now this is how you find OP1, okay? You can use an exactly identical procedure to find OP2 and OP3, which are the principal directions two and three. You know, only thing that you need to do is when you form this set of uh, homogeneous equations, instead of using four, which is the sigma P1, you will have to actually use one, which is sigma P2. And you will essentially get LP2, MP2, and NP2 which will corresponds to OP2. And now instead of four, if you use minus two, then essentially you'll get the uh, direction cosines corresponding to uh, OP3, which is the third principal direction. So essentially you can just, you know, just use the exact same procedure, but with the different principal stresses to get the corresponding directions, okay? And if you do that, you will find that OP2 and OP3 are so, okay? One thing that you can immediately check after you find this three unit vectors or three principal directions is to make sure that the dot product is zero because these three uh, directions have to be orthogonal to each other. So OP1 dot OP2 should be equal to zero, okay? And that kind of becomes obvious here. If you do this here, it'll be like two over square root of six times one over square root of three, okay? Plus one over square root of six times minus one over square root of three, plus one over square root of six times minus one over square root of three, okay? And so essentially this is two by square root of 18, and this is minus one by square root of 18, and this is minus one by square root of 18, they cancel off and they add up to zero. Okay, so OP1 dot OP2 should be equal to zero. You can check that OP2 dot OP3 is zero and OP3 dot OP1 should be zero. So essentially all these uh, principal directions have to be orthogonal to each other, okay? Okay, now once we have find, found the principal stresses and the principal directions, then we can think about finding the maximum shear stress. The maximum shear stress is very trivial. It's just sigma P1 minus sigma P3 divided by two. Okay, and you know what sigma P1 and sigma P3 are, so you can calculate tau max, okay? And the normal to the uh, tau max plane is given by OP3, OP1 plus OP3 divided by the square root of two, okay? This one is a little bit uh, tricky, but it kind of, uh, you know, makes sense if you look at what exactly is happening here, okay? So, if you think of this as the unit vector OP1, okay, and that as the unit vector OP3, let me just erase this, okay. Essentially, OS bisects these two, okay? So, you can think of going one step along OP1, one step along OP3. That is the top numerator here, okay? So if you add them vectorially, that will be your OS, okay? Now, this OS, if you just add OP1 and OP3 directly, 
that unit, that vector will not be a unit vector. It will have a magnitude of square root of two. So essentially, you have to divide that by the square root of two term to get the unit vector along um, the OS. Okay, so OS is going to be just one over square root of two times OP1 plus OP3. Okay, and if you just add them together, this is what you get to be your OS cap. Okay, so what is this OS cap? This is the normal to the plane on which the shear stress is maximum. So on this plane, the shear stress is maximum. Okay, and the normal to that plane is this OS cap. Okay. So again, when you talk about principal directions, what does it mean? These are the directions that are orthogonal or perpendicular to the plane where you have the maximum normal stresses or minimum normal stresses, okay? So if this is a principal plane, then that is OP1, okay? And the normal stress on that plane is sigma P1, okay? So I, you always have to note that when I talk about principal directions, right? It is essentially the direction that is normal to the plane on which the maximum principal stress occurs, okay? So I hope this particular uh, example clarifies to you how you, would have, uh, how you have to calculate the principal stresses, principal directions, the maximum shear stress, and the direction of the maximum shear stress. I want to kind of also point out that it's possible that in my previous lecture, actually I have used a factor of two instead of square root of two. Okay, something that you must keep in mind. If that was, uh, that is what I had used, you now just make a note that OS cap is OP1 cap plus OP3 cap divided by square root of two, not two. Okay, thank you.